Hi guys, Lazar here. In this tutorial, we are creating a fully parametric Y-shaped panelized facade using only Grasshopper. First, we need to create a plane that will act as a base for our rectangle. Then we'll define the X and Y dimensions of the rectangle using two construct domain components. Next, we use the boundary surface component to turn this rectangle into a surface. Now we'll panelize the surface by generating a hexagonal grid using the Lunchbox plugin. But before we proceed, let's take a moment to understand why we're using hexagonal grid in the first place. Let's break this down using a single hexagon. We extract the midpoint of each hexagon edge, then we move every other midpoint inward while pushing the remaining ones outward. After we extract corner points, we now have two list of points, one containing the corner points of the hexagon, another containing the shifted midpoints. By merging these two lists in an alternating order, we can create a single point line that forms the Y shape. This same logic will be applied to the entire hexagonal grid. After applying lunchbox component, hexagons have two vertical sides, but we want them to be oriented with their flat sides horizontal. To achieve this, we need to swap U and V surface directions using the transpose component. Now let's define the number of divisions along U and V directions. To keep the hexagons uniform, I like to use one third for the T per meter as it helps maintain a consistent 60 degree angle. Since we're only interested in hexagons for creating Y-shaped panels, we need to remove any other polygons from the list. To do this, we'll calculate the number of corner points for each polygon. If a polygon has exactly six corners, it's a hexagon, so we keep it. Otherwise, we'll call it from the list. Don't forget to flatten the equality output to match the data structure and use calc pattern component. At this stage, we need to ensure that our hexagons fit within the base rectangle, avoiding any gap along the edges. To do this, we'll use box morph as map to surface doesn't work in this case. So, the base geometry to morph is a list of hexagons, target rectangle is our base rectangular surface, and the reference rectangle should encompass all hexagons. To avoid empty spaces after generating the Y-shaped panels, we'll exclude boundary hexagons from this reference calculation. First, we take all hexagon centers and create a bounding rectangle around them. So I use the bounding box component. Its orientation will match our base plane. Since this box is flat, I convert it into a surface and then into a curve. Next, we filter out hexagons whose centers intersect with this bounding rectangle. Finally, we generate a new reference rectangle from the remaining hexagon centers. Once again, I follow the same process with bounding box and surface container. I then use this surface as a reference for box morph. Now we need to adjust the U and V sliders to get the most uniform hexagons possible. If you don't want to do this manually, you can let Galapagos to do the work for you. Sort all side lengths of the hexagons. Find the smallest and largest values. I will use bounds component and deconstruct it. Calculate the absolute difference. The smaller the difference, the more uniform the hexagons will be. Use Galapagos to minimize this value by setting fitness to the absolute difference and genome to either the U or V slider. Double click on Galapagos and set fitness to minimize, go to solver and click on start solver. Run the solver for about 30 to 45 seconds, then click on stop solver, select the best result and click reinstate. Now let's generate the Y-shaped polygons using the logic we discussed earlier. First we explode each hexagon to extract midpoints of its edges, then we use the scale component to push every other point outward and pull the rest inward. The center of scaling is the hexagon center, which we get by averaging all midpoint positions. A scaling factor of 1 keeps an object the same size, a factor less than 1 shrinks the object and a factor greater than 1 enlarges it. In our case, we need two alternating scale values, one slightly smaller than 1 and the other slightly larger. The easiest way to generate these values is create a slider ranging from 0 to 0 0.5, add this value to 1 
and subtract it from one to get two alternating values. Duplicate this value six times to match the six midpoints of the hexagon and plug them into the scaling factor input. In order to get a Y-shaped polygon, we need another set of points, hexagon corner points that we can extract using this continuity component. Now we can merge our transform midpoints, ultra scaling, and hexagon corners in an alternating pattern using the weave component. Once you get the right order of the points, connect them to point line and don't forget to set true for the closed input. Our next step is to create a set of point lines by joining every two consecutive segments of the Y shape. The goal is to ensure that all point lines form similar angles. Before proceeding, we need to verify this requirement. Extract the midpoint of each segment. We'll scale uh, these points slightly inward to better visualize their index numbers. After checking the geometry, we might notice that our current setup doesn't fully meet this requirement. For example, angle B is slightly larger than angle A. To fix this, we simply shift the list of points that generate the Y-shaped polygon. Now we can connect every two consecutive segments of the Y-shape by extracting a polyline. Then we use partition list with a size of two. So each branch will have two lines that will join together. Now let's discuss how to create panels inside Y-shape. In the slitty mask, we define a pattern to extract even numbered branches from the second branch level. For the first set of point lines, we extract the endpoints of each polyline and connect their endpoint to the center of the hexagon. So extract the center of each point line's vertices duplicate these centers six times creating a list of repeated center points graph to place each point in separate branch and use the same splitting mask and create a line by connecting this data to the extracted endpoints once we have this we can join the new center to endpoint lines with the original point lines forming a new polyline we now repeat the same process for the second set of point lines, but with one key difference. Instead of connecting endpoint to the center, this time we connect the starting point to the center. Merge both sets of point lines in one data structure. To properly define the panel boundaries, we need to evaluate the first and the last line segment of each point line. So first explode point lines and use the cal pattern component with the pattern 1, 0 to select these two segments and connect to the evaluate curve. The curves should be reparameterized to work within a 0 to 1 range. Each branch in our data structure contains two lines, so we need two input values. To ensure that the related points are evenly distanced from the point line ends, the first line will use parameter 1 minus x and the second line will use parameter x. To achieve this, create these two parameter inputs, merge them into a single list and connect the list to the t parameter input of the evaluate curve component. Now we'll introduce an attractor effect to create a gradient variations across the panels. In this example, the attractor will be based on the Z coordinate of each Y shape panel center. You're free to use any other logic if you want, for example, attractor curve or attractor point. Since the Z values need to be remapped into a zero to one range, we'll set the target domain to zero one to one this value can be adjusted later for different effects. A crucial part of this process is setting the source domain input. First, we'll use the bounds domain component to define a domain based on the minimum and the maximum Z coordinates. Be sure to flatten the input. This ensures that all Z coordinates are placed into a single list. At this stage, we could use this domain as our source domain, but I want to introduce flexibility in adjusting the range of affected panels using attractors. Let me explain. If we directly connect the output from the bounds component, only one set of curves will be evaluated with the value of one, the ones with the larger z-coordinate. However, we want multiple curves to be evaluated with the same value. To achieve this, we need to adjust the source domain by modifying its end value. 
with a multiplier ranging from 0 to 1. So later you can tweak these values and adjust the range of affected panels. By reducing this end value, we can construct a new domain and plug it into the source domain input. These adjustments means that all the values from the modified end domain to the bounds end domain are mapped to 1. Just make sure to use the clipped out Basically, this adjustment of domain uh, allow us to change the range of affected panels. Next, we need to match the data structure with the evaluate curve component. Since each hexagon contains six point lines, we must duplicate the remapped value six times using the repeat data component. Once done, we can connect this data to the input that evaluates the curves. The evaluated points will be connected to form a line which we'll use to trim the point lines. To do this, we'll apply curve curve intersection, which finds the intersection points between two uh, input curves, and more importantly, defines their T parameters, the location of the intersections along the curve. These T parameters will be used to trim the point lines using the shatter component. After shattering the point lines, we should end up with three segments per point line. We'll select the middle segment at index one and merge it with the line created by connecting the evaluated points. Be sure to simplify the inputs so that each branch contains exactly two items. Now we can join them to create a closed polyline which will be used to generate surfaces with boundary surface component. Since some surfaces may extend beyond the initial rectangle, we need to trim those access parts. We can achieve this by using the region intersection component, where A is the list of panel surfaces and B is the region rectangle. To prevent Grasshopper from constantly recalculating while adjusting parameters, I'm adding data dam. This acts like a gate, allowing us to control when data flows through. Finally, to clean up the data, we'll use clean tree component to remove branches that contain zero items, set the remove empty input to true, then connect it to the boundary surface component to create the final panel shapes. If you want to dive deeper, there is a 3 hour video waiting for you. In it, I will explain how to apply this pattern to a periodic surface. We'll cover everything from creating a hexagonal grid that takes into account the periodic nature of surfaces, then unifying curve orientations and corner points positions to welding contour points to eliminate gaps caused by non-flat base surfaces. If that sounds like something you would like to check out, join our How to Rhino Premium community. You'll get one workshop and one mini course every month plus access to all extended YouTube tutorials and project files. See you inside.